so much, Jim, for being with us tonight and sharing your story. And so, obviously, Jim was fighting in the, the war in the South Pacific, and at the same time, we obviously were in <coughs> rural war, and our next guest, uh, Ed Beck, was in Europe fighting uh, the Germans, because apparently there was two factions that just thought both of them needed to take over the world. So these men were fighting for us that weren't even born yet, for our <coughs> up and coming freedoms, and they had their friends die, and uh, suffered through their lives the feelings that now all of us have had with, with our men that have died. So uh, our next guest would be Ed, Ed Beck, if you'd like to stand up here. people here. Well, I got Jim and I's the oldest persons here. But anyway, uh, I'm a native Pennsylvanian, joined the Army in 1943, and uh, we crossed the Pacific Ocean, landed in Scotland, England, Glasgow, and then took a train down to England, and from there we were there about I guess about 10 days because the one of the ships got sunk for some supplies on it. And then uh, we finally went to Liverpool, got on that landing craft, and uh, landed in France, waited ashore. And uh, we kept our unit, kept on going up through, going up through uh, Luxembourg, Belgium, and into Germany. We we're in the Ardennes Forest. And uh, no matter how a rank or anything you be, you can make mistakes. And I believe yet that if General Eisenhower, General Montgomery, and General Charles de Gaulle, they decided to go into a holding area and stop pushing the Germans, because we were deep into Germany. I was in the Ardennes Forest. So anyway, on the 16th of December, they say, where in the hell did they get all them tanks and men with a million troops Germans sent in for us? And of course, uh, on the 16th, they hit real hard. And then on the 18th, this 18th, the major guys in small groups so when you get hit by artillery. And they said the colonel got killed when they 88 his CP. And see, we were going to move out, recapture a town that somebody else lost. Well, uh, we moved out, it was getting dark, and the Germans chopped us up in small groups. And I can remember in the morning of the 19th, we went into an open, there was just a captain, and about 20 of us out of 240. Normally, a company has 240 men in it. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes, anyway, uh, we uh, met up with this here our anti tank outfit. There was about 10 men in there, and they had some vehicles. So they decided uh, we're going to move out of that area to a better area. And we got on this old dirt road with snow and one in there, came out. And uh, the captain, our captain, he was riding in that first Jeep. When he got down to a T, German said, never at the Zuka, and that was, that was the end of the officers. And uh, of course, we couldn't move forward, so we dismounted, and uh, we're out in the open. The Germans were in the tree area there. So they finally got the word, you threw down your weapons, because we had going uh, without food and water anyhow for a couple of days. And uh, like the major said, we'd been surrounded for three days when we moved out of there. And anyhow, they, 
I asked the uh, platoon sergeant, I said, give me your compass. And he said, no, I know what you're going to do. I was gonna, I wasn't going to surrender. I was going to get out of there. But anyway, I ended up being captured with the rest of them. They marched us out. And uh, when it got real dark, the uh, old German guards, with, they put us in a circle. And we sat down in the snow. And uh, in the morning, we marched out again. They finally got to Limburg. And, uh, from there, they put us in box cars, and we were supposed to move out. But the British were good at bumming at nighttime, and uh, they come over bumming the track out. So we were locked up in there about two days. We got out of there, and he started walking. We walked for five days, nothing to eat. And then finally, uh, we got in box cars again, and I got to uh, Muehlberg, which is a uh, Start like 4B. And uh, when we jumped out, we did in the snow, we walked in, and the car, the box car in front of us, uh, we were so packed in there like sardines that when they, uh, everybody started getting out, well, one guy had died, they never knew it. But when they moved away, right, he fell down. And from there, when they put me into a, we had 45 of us, and they sent us to a, detail, work in detail, and it worked in a stone quarry, breaking rock. And uh, no matter how bad times are, you know, these, they call us out in the morning, and they start counting, hard and swipe, dry, clear, and uh, one man missing. So this one guy, he decided he wasn't going to go out. And we had uh, Double bunks with straw, they were sleeping on straw with little bugs crawling in them. Anyway, uh, they go in and uh, he comes running out and he thought, and he was kidding him. I thought you weren't going to go, I thought you weren't going to go. He says, shut up. And then finally, he said, if somebody sits up beating up your butt, you're going to throw anyhow. They went right up through the bed. And, uh, and on the one warm day, it was in February, where I, uh, we always watched the bombers come over. You ever see a thousand bombers, B-17s? They make a hell of a noise, they shake the ground. And I, I came a thousand at a time. And uh, we heard these planes coming, there's a woman pushing a little baby coach, a little baby in it, and she's going down the road. And at the end of the stone choir, there was a tunnel, a tunnel. And uh, she grabbed that little one out of there, run for that tunnel, and the guards run for the tunnel. <laughs> and anyhow, uh, we just laughed and said, give them hell, give them hell. And uh, finally, uh, I got in such a bad shape that uh, the commandant on the prison camp there, who kept calling me in, and interrogating me all the time, and uh, I knew, nobody knew why. I was the only one he called in. But after the war, when I back to Germany, and I found out that uh, General Ludwig Beck, and then things started clicking. Anyhow, he conspired with some other officers and also some listed men, some sergeants, and uh, it failed. And he went to pick up the general, the Gestapo go to pick him up. He said, I want to go in and say goodbye to wife and children, because he knew what was coming. He goes in and opens the desk door, takes his wife's pistol out, shoots himself in the head. So then this woman told me that's how they, they killed him. You know, the children went and told me. And then I knew, because my name was Beck, I guess he thought I was part of that group. But anyway, I ended up in the hospital for 34 days, and we finally got out of there, and uh, I talked to two guys to escape. And uh, they said, if you escape, you know what that happens? They kill you. I said, I know that. But uh, anyway, I said, uh, I'm gonna go. But the Russians, we had uh, about 20 or 30 Russian prisoners there. They had marched them out. And when they were marching down the road, I guess, a P-51 comes over and they thought they were German troops and started strafing them. And they scared. And the one came back in. How he got in, I don't know. 
but he had a pair of wire cutters. And uh, I told him in German, and uh, get the wire cutters. And my buddy says, what the hell are you gonna do with them? I said, I'm gonna go home. He said, you're gonna die. So uh, I got two guys to go with me. One was uh, from Hershey, Pennsylvania. He's Julius Purcell. He's Italian-American, speak Italian. And I got another kid from New Jersey. He could speak Polish. He was Yankovic. So, uh, Oh, Julius says, when are we going to go? I said, when the guards are changed at noon time. So we cut a hole in the back in the back there, and we took off. And uh, with God's will, why, we did make it back. And we spent a German, in a German hospital. What happened, uh, we told Julius Purcell, we got to find a place to sleep. And the Germans had a lot of big buildings, big iron gates on them. So, uh, yeah, Judas says, well, let's go over there. There's a guard on the gate. I said, you're crazy, man, we just escaped. He says, uh, we have a place. And we talked to the guard. He opened the gate and lets us in. It's a hospital. And we walked in, and I thought it was Herman Gordon sitting behind that desk there, and I said, we're dead, man. So anyhow, uh, we told him we're American prisoners, you know, and he jumped out of that chair down the hall and uh, he comes back and he says the doctor will see you soon he's just all in germany he says they all see you and i said the hell i want to so uh, finally we got to see the doctor and uh it talked to the other kid he had all bad feet i just about lost mine they said i just had enough blood to keep him alive anyway i looked out the window and it's getting dark and and a, a jeep, American jeep pulls in, some sergeant in. And uh, he had a special flag, didn't carry no weapons. And he come in, and we told him, he said, there ain't no American troops in this area. He said, but there's a whole camp back there. So uh, that's why we got straight a couple times. Anyway, he, uh, we wanted to go get in that jeep. He said, oh, no, 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 no. He said, I, I'm a special convoy. He said, I can go in and out their lines. He said, but if you get in that Jeep, I'm dead. So uh, he did, did get me arrangements. And the next day, in the morning, while the ambulance come in and took us down to the airfield that the Americans took over. And uh, from there, we flew into Camp Lucky Strike, France. And I got to go through the best tent with General Eisenhower. And from there, finally, we, I got back to the States on the 15th of June, 1945. And uh, the only thing you talk about when you're a prisoner is uh, food, food, food. Because uh, everybody come out there we're losing 40 to 50, 60 pounds. So anyway, uh, it gives me an honor to be one of you young people because you are the people that are gonna keep this going. Out of, out of 60 and a half million, many troops, men and women who served in World War II, there's less than a million left, and they're dying at 400 a day, according to the VA. So uh, us great people from the great generation, like Jim and I, well, we wish you all luck, and pleased to be here, and thank you for listening to the old soldier.